Okay, good morning, gang. Looks like, yeah, we've got a fair amount of people here. I'm glad to see you all made it in okay. I know that there was some confusion with Canvas adding people so late, so I'm really grateful that everybody was able to get in. Um, I am John Filesticker. You can call me John or Professor John or JP, whatever makes you feel comfortable. Um, give me one second here to set up a few things, and then we are going to get started. I will be sharing my screen. Um, and I'll, I'll ask that when I do that, you go ahead and leave it as full size so you can see everything that I'm writing down. Um, there's one little thing I wanted to find before we get rolling here, and that was an emulator. I don't know if I still have this installed. Oh, I do. Okay, good. All right. Good, 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 good. good. Let's get this up. Oh, it's wrong. And it's blocked by administrator. Oh, are you? All right, we'll deal with that when we get to it. So I'm going to go ahead and turn on my screen share here. And then we are going to go through a few things. First off, uh, here is the document camera that I'll be using for the lecture notes through the semester. Uh, let me find a nice working pen here. Swap this one's insides. Today we're going to go over the syllabus, we're going to talk about how the course works, and then we are going to do some actual mathematics today. Um, so please, uh, I advise you to have pen and paper ready. I'll show you. This is how I'm going to open all of our lectures. This is Mac 1105, which is the course code for college algebra, uh, section 007. It's a lecture. And today's date is 1-5. 21 today. Today we're going to do the following things. We're going to go through the syllabus. I know that's everybody's favorite thing to do on day one, but we have to do it. Um, and then we're going to start chapter one. Uh, we're going to specifically be talking about real numbers. We're going to have a refresher on interval notation. Uh, and then we're going to start talking about functions. I'm going to talk a little bit about function notation, uh, what makes a relationship between sets a function rather than a non-function, and different ways you can represent functions. Um, so this first item, the syllabus here, let's get started on that. First thing I'd like to do is show everybody how to get to the syllabus. So if you made it to this lecture, then odds are you have figured out Canvas pretty well. Uh, I'll show you kind of what this looks like. So when you log into Canvas, um, you should have a, a dashboard like this or a list of courses you can pull up. Of course, this one right here, Winter 21, we call it Winter at Santa Fe instead of Spring, but Winter 21, Mac 1105.007. Those last three digits there are the section number. If anybody ever asks you, you're in section 007. You click that and that'll bring up this page. If you're using the Canvas app, the mobile app, I did check this, everything seems to be loading okay, but if you're having trouble finding something, I recommend pulling up a, a web browser either in your phone or preferably on a, on a computer, on a laptop or a desktop, because sometimes things don't display correctly in mobile. Class meetings, of course, you've figured it out. Uh, we are here today, it's Tuesday, um, Tuesday and Thursday, 9.30 to 10.45, and you'll always find the link to the lecture over here. So every day that we have class, I will post another announcement just like this with the date and a link to the Zoom lecture. I am recording these lectures, um, and I will upload the recording to YouTube after class, and then I will post that link um, to this very same announcement. You'll see me later today, I'll update this, and it'll say updated with link to recording. There will be a, a YouTube link in there. Um, if you haven't done already, please read this announcement. Uh, it just outlines what I said, you know, how to attend lecture. Watching the videos is not an appropriate substitution for coming to lecture, and I will be taking attendance. You need to attend. Um, I'll get into the attendance portion of the grade when we get into the syllabus in a minute. Another little intro thing I want to talk about is, is my math lab. Uh, so let's go back to the home page, which is the syllabus page. And if you could click here to download the syllabus. And you want to keep a copy of this saved on your computer. So I'll, I'll go ahead and save another copy just for fun. Drop it on the desktop. All right. So here is our syllabus. Um, you've got, of course, my name, my office, 
uh, but because we're still doing everything remotely, you won't find me in that office. Uh, so the best way to get a hold of me is definitely email. And when you email me, please include the class, say, you know, college algebra uh, section 007 in your subject line so I can filter the emails. Class meetings are here. Um, obviously, we know that office hours are going to be done on Zoom, and they are Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 1 to 2 p.m., Tuesday and Thursday from 11 to 12, um, and you get there by following the appropriate links in Canvas. So each of these is a Zoom link for recurring meetings. This meeting recurs every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 1 to 2. This meeting recurs every Tuesday, Thursday from 11 to 12. So to come to an office hour, you just wait for the appropriate time, like this, after, or this morning at 11, you can come here and click this and you'll join another Zoom meeting just like the one we're in now. I'm gonna come back to the syllabus. Uh, the final exam for this class, I'd like everybody to put this in their calendar on their phone right now with one or two warnings, like a warning a day ahead and a warning a couple hours ahead. It's Tuesday, April 27th, 2021 at 1030 AM. And that's a two hour final. I'm sorry, I have an alarm going off in another room. I'll be right back. Okay. All righty. Uh, the prereq for this class, everybody's probably aware of, you need to get through MAT 1033 or a equivalent, you know, high school class or test into this class. The course materials for the class, you need an access code for my math lab. Um, if you haven't bought this yet, that's okay. You can still register in my math lab using this course ID. But when it asks you for your access code, if you haven't bought one yet, scroll down to the bottom of that page and look for a link that says begin temporary access or use trial access. That will get you in for two weeks. If you haven't bought an access code, you can still register for my math lab right now. Um, you just have to use the temporary or trial access that will expire after two weeks. So you need to sometime in the next two weeks, get your hands on an access code. You can get them at the bookstore with your financial aid, um, or you can buy them online. Sometimes you can hunt down cheaper versions if you're patient um, looking in places like um, Abe Books or Amazon. Um, so do please get yourself an MML access code and do please register uh, using this course ID in my math lab. There's a link in Canvas. I do not have Canvas and MML merged together. I found that that just creates lots of extra confusion. It's unnecessary. But if you follow this link, it'll take you to MML. Now I'm logged in. So if I wasn't logged in, it would take you to the portal here. Uh, where you can sign in. If you don't have a, a credential for MML, you can register and uh, it will ask you for a few things. It'll ask you for your, your name, email address. Please use your Santa Fe email. Don't use a different email. It's important that you use your Santa Fe email here. Um, and at some point it will ask you for a course ID. That's where you enter this information from the syllabus, this code right here. That is the course ID. And it will also ask you for an access code. And again, if you don't have an access code, on that page, just scroll down a little bit and you'll see a light gray link, at least it was light gray uh, last time I taught this class, um, that says click here to begin trial access or click here to use the temporary access. Once you've gone through that registration process, you'll find yourself here. This is where all the homework and all the quizzes for the class are going to be. And if you look, you'll see that we actually have a few assignments open already. So your first three homeworks are this week. They're on just the definitions of functions, evaluating functions, concepts like domain and range. And then we're gonna talk about linear functions this week, functions that whose graphs are straight lines. All of those are open now, or they will be opening, yeah, they're, uh, they'll be opening at the end of class today. And they're gonna be due the following week, the following Tuesday at the start of class. So I'll, I'll get into more detail about that when we get down to that portion of the syllabus. Is everybody with me so far? Just give me a, a little, I don't know if you guys have used Zoom, like give me a thumbs up react. You can find the reactions button at the bottom. Give me a thumbs up react if you're able to follow everything so far. And if you have any questions, go ahead and type them in chat or you can hold space bar. It's like a walkie talkie. You can hold space bar to talk if you'd like to do that. So any questions so far? I'll keep the chat window up here. Okay, so moving on. 
this is college algebra. Uh, in this class, we do algebra, um, the type of algebra that people usually learn in college. It's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, you can see a full list of the topics we're going to cover here in the official course objective page, but basically we're going to play around with a bunch of different functions. This class, um, we start by talking about linear functions, then we talk about quadratic functions, uh, then we talk about other sorts of polynomials, uh, power functions, radical functions, then we jump to exponential and logarithm functions, and at the end we talk about systems of equations and systems of inequalities. Broadly speaking, those are the topics for this class. A little more specifically, we talk about real life situations for each of those function types, and there's a heavy emphasis on graphing, and a heavy emphasis on doing those real world problems. Cell phone policy. Uh, my general rule is just, you know, DBAA. Don't, don't be um, an arsehole, be, be reasonable, be kind. Um, since we don't have class meetings, that's not a huge deal, but this is. Your phone cannot be, yeah, no phones. You cannot have access to any phones or iPads or any wonky stuff like that. Um, during exams. Last semester, I had to fry quite a few people for, um, for having their phones out during tests. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, but in general, just don't be rude, don't distract other people. Um, we want to make sure everybody feels welcome, feels listened to, um, and feels like they have a place here. And that can really be damaged if other people are, are having loud side conversations or anything like that, even in the chat. So let's keep the chat respectful um, and, and focused on what we're trying to talk about. And um, and everything will be just fine. The attendance policy. So I'm going to take role every day using Zoom logs. Zoom tells me when you signed in, when you signed out of the meeting, um, and it also records all of the chat. So be mindful of that. Um, but I'll take attendance every day using the Zoom logs. And there is a class participation uh, grade here. So you're allowed to miss five lectures. If you miss more than five lectures, for each lecture you miss after that, I'm going to take off a half percentage point. Now there's a, a five percentage, um, five percent of your grade comes from participation. So if you were to miss a total of 15 lectures, then you would lose all of that. That's a lot of lectures to miss and hopefully nobody will even get close to that. Um, this is not meant to hurt you. This is just here to kind of encourage you to continue coming to class. Uh, this is a Zoom class. Nobody has to get on a bus. Nobody even has to get dressed. So please just show up and at the very least listen. Um, but really, it's important that you're taking notes, paying attention, asking asking questions, um, following along with the examples, things like that. Makeup work, late work. I'm really loose about this. There are deadlines set in my math lab every week, like the three assignments I mentioned earlier for this week. But if you ever need anything extended, I'm happy to do it. All right. So if you don't manage to get all of the homework done in a given week and you need one or two of the assignments extended, just send me an email. In that email, tell me you know what class you're in and what assignment you need extended and I will be happy to do that. Um, exams are a little bit different. If you miss a test, a midterm test, without letting me know, um, then I'll need a, a good written documented excuse. I'll need something like you know, a uh, doctor's note or a note from the police saying that you got in a car accident, whatever. Uh, but if you think you might miss an exam, then just let me know ahead of time and I will work with you to schedule a makeup. I try to be really loose about this stuff because all I care about is that you guys do the work and learn the material. Um, it's not The timeline is not super important to me. The timeline is just there to help keep you on track. So if you need more time on a homework, don't be shy. Just email me. Let me know what, what homework you need extended. If you know you're going to miss an exam or if you think you might miss an exam, please email me ahead of time and let me know. We'll work out a makeup. If you miss an exam and you're unable to let me know ahead of time, I'll need some sort of explanation or excuse. Um, and my rule is that we can only do this within one week. All right. So if you miss something like a test and a whole week goes by and then you tell me, oh, shit, I had no idea there was a test. I missed it. I can't help you. We got to get it sorted out within a week. I think that's fairly liberal. I don't know. Um, I don't have any problem doing that. So just talk to me, communicate with me, and everything will be fine. Um, there are in-class activities in this class, and those cannot be made up, right? The in-class activities involve participation with your classmates, talking back and forth about solutions to problems, and that's not something I can recreate. So if you miss one of those, um, then I, I can't help you. Uh, that is that's just going to be a zero. Now, the activities don't count for a large portion of the grade, um, and it's not the end of the world if you miss one. And I'll do my best to give you guys a heads up uh, the days on which we're going to do in-class activities. 
Um, but it's your responsibility to not miss these. These happen during lecture, just like what we're doing right now. They happen during lecture. Um, and if you miss one, we can't make them up. Uh, the last little note here, uh, after the final exam, I can't do any makeups. So if like the final doesn't go well for you and you're like, oh shit, I should have gone back and done all that homework to help my grade. Can you please open this up so I can work on it more after the final? The answer is no. So just make sure you're, you're on top of things um, and don't let this, that final date go by without something that you need to be made up being made up. Homework. So my math lab is where you'll spend most of your working time for this class. All the homework and all the quizzes are in MML. Let's see if I can show you. I think this is what it should look like from your perspective when you sign in. Um, they're not going to be here because they don't open until after class starts. So I'll come over here for now. You can see the assignments that I've allocated for this week. There's an algebra readiness assignment. There's homework one, which is on the definition of a function and different ways to represent them. Homework two, which is on evaluating functions, graphs of functions, concepts like domain and range. Um, and then homework three, which is on our, our first category of specific functions. Those are linear functions. So you've got those assignments and a quiz, all of which are going on this week. They're going to open today as soon as class ends. You see the start date over here. And they're going to be due next Tuesday at the start of class. So you have exactly one week to work each set. Do please try to keep up with these. I said, and I'm, I'm definitely holding to it, that I am happy to extend any assignment. But you see that they kind of come in blocks, right? This quiz has to do with these three homeworks. You want to do these three homeworks, then this quiz, and that will help reinforce all of that material. It's structured that way for a reason, so please try to respect that structure. When you come in here, do the algebra readiness first. Even if it's a little bit boring to you, it's not very long, it's worth getting in there and doing. Then start knocking out the homeworks. So the homework will always be uh, directly from the lecture material. The quiz will always be directly from the homework, and it'll always be related to what we're talking about that week in class. So by keeping up with this, you'll keep the class and your homework in sync. That's really important for reinforcing what we talk about in lecture. If those fall out of sync, if you fall behind on the homework, then things will start to feel like they're not related to each other. And that can be really frustrating. Let's see. Oh, that's right. We're in the browser. OK, so the homework is in my math lab. And they open the first day of class each week. They'll be due at the start of class the following week. There's also a quiz in MML for each, uh, pretty much each section of the textbook, one or two quizzes per week on average. There will be some weeks where we you know, have two quizzes. There'll be some weeks where we have one like this week. There may even be some weeks where we don't have any. I don't think so. Um, maybe some exam weeks. But that's roughly the, the deal. You're going to have about three homework assignments per week, about one or two quizzes per week. They open at the end of class on Tuesday, and they are due at the start of class the following Tuesday, giving you exactly one week to work on them. Projects and activities are another component of the grade here. So the in-class activities, I talked about those uh, when we talked about makeup work. Those are things that we do during lecture here. I'll assign you guys to breakout rooms, give you some problems to work. You'll talk about them amongst yourselves, and then we'll come through and talk about them. I will grade those live during class and enter the grades afterwards. They cannot be made up. They have to be done during class. There are also these things called projects. Um, and I'll scroll down to the calendar for a minute here. You see there's approximately one project per exam. There's a project two and exam two are the same week. Project one and exam one are the same week. Project three I assigned during spring break to make sure you don't forget everything we talked about over spring break. And then exam three is down here. So they're not joined together. But then project four and exam four also come together. So for each exam, there is a project. And the project is meant to, to give you something to work on at home, uh, to go a little bit deeper into the material, and most importantly, uh, lets me see your written work before the test. Um, I want to see what you guys write down on a piece of paper, not just what you type into MML, because when it comes to the exams, your written work matters a lot. Let me scroll back up here. All right, before I talk about the tests, are there any questions on the homework, quizzes, projects, activities, any of that stuff? 
Same deal. If you're cool, give me a thumbs up. Uh, if you got questions, you can hold down the space to talk or you can type in chat. Everybody understands when the homework opens and when it closes. Yeah, so as soon as class ends today, your first set of homework is going to open up uh, and that will all be due at the start of class next Tuesday. Projects and activities, we'll do an activity in class this week and we'll have a, our first project um, before exam one. The exams um, are the largest component of the grade and I'll show you the grade breakdown in just one second, but there's going to be four regular midterm exams. Those are going to happen during class time. They're going to be in Canvas and they're gonna be proctored by honor lock. Now I'm doing something extra for proctoring this semester. You're also going to have to have your phone signed into Zoom. So honor lock is gonna be watching you through your webcam. They're gonna be recording your screen, your web traffic. I'm gonna be watching you through Zoom on your phone. So we're gonna to need uh, to make sure you have your smartphone with Zoom installed. I know probably many of you are watching this lecture on your phones right now, that's fine. But when it comes time for the exam, you're going to have to sign into Honorlock and you're going to have to, on your phone, sign into Zoom. Um, and we do this for a few reasons. The most important one is that Honorlock doesn't record your hands, your workspace, your desk. Um, and that's the shit I really need to see to proctor. So for the exams, you're going to set up your phone on the side so that it shows your hands, your paper, your pen, everything you're writing. Um, and I will be watching that personally. I'll explain more about the proctoring when we get closer to the first exam, but I just want to give you a heads up. We will be using Honor Lock, but in addition to Honor Lock, you will need to be signed into Zoom on your phone and have your phone set up so I can see your workspace. All right, I, I don't need to see your faces. All right, your faces are, are wonderful, and I'm happy to see everybody there working on the tests in Honor Lock, but what I really need to see to proctor are your hands and your desk. The final exam, again, is on the 27th of April uh, at 10.30 a.m. Uh, and that's going to be in my math lab. So the midterm exams are in Canvas. I'll show you where you'll go to get to those. And we'll do this again when we get closer. But you'll go to assignments here. And they're not in there now, but there will be a, a thing here that says exam one. You know, and you'll click that. It'll launch on our lock. OK. Um, if you have a problem with the additional proctoring, if you don't have a smartphone with a working camera or for whatever reason you are unable to get Honor Lock to work, contact me. Uh, the college has loaner laptops that we can set you up with to work with Honor Lock. I can get you a webcam if you don't have a smartphone to use Zoom on. Um, we will make this work. All right. If you're, if you're worried about there being a thing, if you don't have the technology or your webcam's broken on your laptop or anything like that, um, contact me as soon as possible, like way before the exam, like today, um, and we will get that figured out. I can get you some hardware to use. All right. Here's the grade breakdown. Class participation, 5%. That's the attendance thing we talked about. Online assignments. This is the homework and the quizzes in my math lab. So the homework and quizzes, 10%. Activities and projects. Uh, the activities are the things we do in class. The projects are the things I send home with you before each test. Those are worth 10%. The midterm exams, those four exams we talked about, those are worth half the grade. So each one is worth 12.5%. And then the final is worth a full quarter of the grade. So you see 75% of the grade comes from these proctored exams. That's almost everything. Right? There's, there's room to wiggle here, and these things can bring a, you know, a, a C up to an A, if that's the difference. If your exam average is a C, but you nail all these other things, then you're going to get an A in the class. Um, but most of it comes from the midterm and the final. The grading scale is the normal one. 90 to 100 is an A, 80 to 90 is a B, 70 to uh, 80 is a C, and so on. But the top three points in each category get the plus designation. Um, and people always ask me at the end of the semester, hey, if, if I have like a 79.5, can I get a B? Yes. My rule is if you're within a half a percent of the next letter grade, I will always round up. If you're within 1% of the next letter grade, then it kind of depends on specifics. Um, but, you know, I, to make things nice and clear, this is the grading scale. And if you're within a half percent, I will definitely round up at the end of the semester. If you're within like 0.75, if you have like an 89.2 or an 89.3 and you want to know if that's going to be rounded up to an A, send me an email and we'll talk. Um, but the, the usual rule is within a half percent, I will round up to the next grade. Any questions on the grades and grading scale? 
like where your grade comes from or how I will be assessing uh, success in the class. I had a question about the project real quick. Sure. Yeah, what's up? Um, are those going to be like group projects or are they individual? The activities are group activities, but the projects are individual. So I can actually show you an example of a project that I used last time I taught this class. Where is my 11 of our stuff here? This project, I think it might be in here. Yeah. So here's an example of project one that I used in spring 2020. Um, those are intended to be completed individually. So you'll you'll uh, work these questions on your own at home. Uh, I think here we were talking about proportionality. So as the pizza gets bigger, its area gets bigger, um, and the cost gets bigger. But you know which one maximizes the amount of pizza you get per dollar? That sort of thing. Uh, these are these are what the projects look like, and they are to be completed alone individually. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you, Logan. Did anybody else have any questions? All right, we're almost through most of the syllabus. The next thing I'd like you guys to do, and I'm gonna pause for a minute so you can do this, um, grab out your calendar and your phones and put these things in there. These things are important. Uh, of course, classes begin today. You don't need to add that, but this, this is important the last day to add classes. So if you're to decide that you don't want to be in this class, you want to take this class with somebody else, you can drop this class up to the 11th, but you can't add another class past the 7th. So please make sure you have these. Uh, oh, Kendra asks a really good question in chat here. Do you have to use your Santa Fe email for Zoom? I would really prefer that you did. Um, it makes my life a lot easier. At the very least, please make sure that your name that you're typing in for Zoom is the same name that you have on your Santa Fe ID card. That way, when I take roll, I can compare the, the roster to the names I see in Zoom without having to second guess. Uh, if you use a nickname or something like that, that'll make life harder. There's no official requirement, Kendra, that you have to use your Santa Fe email. As long as I can tell for sure who you are from the name you've used when you signed into Zoom, I'll be happy. But it does make my life easier if you use your Santa Fe email. So I would prefer that. So a good question from Kendra. Did anybody else have other questions? All right, so let's take a second and type these into our phone. Last day to add is 1-7. It's the last day you can join another class. That's real soon, right? That's two days from now. That's Thursday. So if you're going to swap into another 1105 class or swap at, add any other classes for any reason, you got to do that before Thursday, before the end of day Thursday. The last day to bounce and get your money back is the 11th. That is next Monday. So if you decide, I don't want to take college algebra this semester, or you know I, I just really don't want to do this for whatever reason, any of your classes, the last day to get your money back and not have anything on your transcript is the 11th. Our first holiday is the 18th. That's Dr. King's birthday. The college is, of course, closed for that. And then we don't have any other holidays until March. Uh, spring break, the college will be closed from March 8th through March 13th. Here's another important one to put on your calendar, the last day to get a W, right? So this, uh, if it's usually about two thirds of the way through the semester, if things are going really poorly and you know there's no way you can turn it around, there's no way for you to earn the grade you need to earn in the class, or for whatever reason you don't wanna continue and finish the class with a letter grade, the last day that you can withdraw from the class and get a W on your transcript instead of an A through F letter grade is March 24th. So I would make sure to put one seven, last day to add, 111, last day to drop, and 324 in your calendar for sure. And um, then the other one I would really like you guys to make sure you have in your calendar is the day of the final. That is again, April 27th. I'll hold here just for a second and uh, refresh my coffee while you guys do that. And then when I get back, we're gonna do some boilerplate stuff, some calendar stuff, and then we start with that.
Take care of me. You're a good boy. You know that? All right. So I'm going to move away from these important dates. Hopefully you have these in your calendar now. If not, um, again, please save a copy of the syllabus so you can refer back to it later. This next page is all fairly boring boilerplate syllabus stuff. Got to be there. The Jellos, general education learning outcome, has nothing to do with your grade, doesn't show up in your transcript, but it's a statistic that the college and the state like to track. There are going to be a few questions on the final that are specifically looking for skills with quantitative reasoning. Um, and that's something that we will record. You may notice a mark on the test saying like a G or Jello or something like that. Um, don't stress about it. It's not something you need to worry about. It has nothing to do with your grade. <sighs> Academic integrity, and we will talk more about this later. Um, read these rules, please. All right, you can click the link. <laughs> really important you guys know what rules you're supposed to follow. It's unfortunate, but right now is a difficult time for academic integrity with things being shifted online, kind of force shifted online. I know a lot of you guys don't like that. I would definitely prefer to be in a classroom rather than doing this remotely. But with COVID right now, this is the way we have to do it. And it's a little bit complicated. Dan Rodkin is the man on campus who is in charge of taking care of student conduct issues. Um, and he has been extremely busy lately because there has been a lot of academic dishonesty. And it's something that professors were fairly forgiving about last spring, maybe more forgiving than they should have been over the summer and the fall. But we are cracking down hard on this. Think about that two camera proctoring system. We are cracking down very hard on this. So everybody should take the time to read these rules and know exactly what it is that you are being um, held accountable for. To give a, a neat example, a few semesters ago, I had a student staple $200 cash to a late assignment and leave it in my office. Uh, that student was expelled from the college, got a ZF in the class, and I think might have even lost his, um, his visa. He was here from overseas. It was bad. Um, things like that happen, but there are much more subtle things. Uh, plagiarism is one of the things that's a big issue right now. Copying something from Photomath or Bartleby is plagiarism, and you can get in trouble for it. Don't do that. Ah, um, what else? Of course, sharing anything with anybody else. Um, it's okay if you guys have a group me or a Discord. I actually really encourage you to create a group me or a Discord so you can talk about problems with each other in a setting where you're feeling safe and you're not being observed and you, and you don't feel judged. But for the love of God, do not do that shit during tests or about tests or anything to do with proctored assignments. Um, I won't say a whole lot more about this right now, but yes, please just read these rules. It's important that you know what you're being held accountable for. ADA stuff. If you have a disability, um, or if you have any sort of accommodations associated with the DRC or anything like that, or you think you might be eligible for um, accommodations associated with DRC, then uh, please let me know. Talk to the people in the DRC. They're very helpful and very kind over there, but sometimes a little bit slow. Um, so if you've got something, if you requested an accommodation through the DRC, but they haven't turned it around fast enough, you can talk to me. I'll work with you directly. Um, if we have to go around the DRC, we have to go around the DRC. But I want to make sure everybody feels sufficiently accommodated, efficient, uh, you know, sufficiently welcome. Um, the ADA is the, the law that governs what we're required to do, but there's no reason why we can't do things that are outside of that. So if there's anything you need to feel comfortable, to feel welcome, to feel like you have the tools you need to succeed in this class, don't hesitate to ask me. I will do everything I can to get you those tools. Accessibility is a similar thing. Um, if you need a screen reader or if you're having trouble accessing the materials of the class or if you're having trouble getting the technology that you need to make things run appropriately, um, just let me know. Again, the college does have loaner laptops. Um, I can help you get a laptop if you need one. We got webcams. We got everything you could possibly need. All you have to do is ask. So please talk to me if there's anything you need. Um, I will help you with that. Discrimination and harassment. This is a big deal. Um, although it's not something we usually need to work too hard, just don't be an asshole, right? Please be kind to each other, be kind to me. Um, make sure everybody feels like they have a place in this class because everybody does have a place in this class. If you're here, that means you belong here. So please be kind to each other, be kind to me, um, be kind to college staff when you call them or work with them. Everybody has a right to be here. 
Um, what we're talking about rights here, rights and responsibilities, kind of similar to the, the thing up above about academic integrity. I strongly suggest clicking this link and reading the content because these are, again, things that you are responsible for. Now at the bottom, I've added an extra note on cheating. This is something that's not previously been in my syllabus, but I'm gonna read it verbatim because um, it's been a pet peeve. I know that right now, online, whether we wanna be or not online, we are. Right now, it's really tempting to Google things, to have photo map on an extra phone on the side, to have somebody else in the room Googling things and sliding you stuff under the desk. I've seen a million different flavors of cheating. I know what it looks like. Even if you think your cheating scheme is very clever, I know what it looks like. I've been doing this a long time. I was also a student once. Um, so please, please don't cheat. I know that you guys may have gotten away, and many of you, most of you, I'm sure have been honest, but also you may have gotten away with some shit in the last few semesters that you shouldn't have gotten away with. It's not gonna be like that anymore. All right, I take this stuff super duper seriously. I will spend all the time in the world with you working to make sure that you're ready for a test. I will do everything I can to help you succeed in this class. But if you try to cheat, I'm gonna catch you. And if I catch you, I'm gonna fry you as hard as I can. I have no patience for that shit. I do watch the honor lock videos on two speed while I grade. Um, I will be watching through Zoom during the test. I don't have any reason to hesitate starting a conduct trial. Um, I've had to do it a bunch of times in the past. It'll probably happen again in the future, but I would really love it if it did not happen. So please, please, please just be honest. All right, don't do anything dishonest. Specifically, I'm talking about shit like PhotoMath, Wolfram Alpha, Bartleby, Googling things, talking with anybody on GroupMe or Discord or anything at all during a test. Talking uh, with anybody or seeking help for any proctored assignment will be aggressively prosecuted. I won't hesitate to do it. Now here at the bottom, this is, this is important. If a test is coming up and you're like, shit, there's no way I can make this happen. I'm just not ready for it. I'm gonna have to blank where blank is anything sketchy or fucked up. Instead of doing that, just contact me. Just send me an email saying, you know, I feel the weight of the world on me. I'm getting crushed. I'd have no idea what to do here. I'll help you, all right? I will. Um, I can move dates around. I can give you extra tutoring. I can work with you directly myself or find other tutors that you like to work with. Um, I'm willing to be very flexible here. The trade-off is I want you to be very honest here. As long as you're honest with me, I will bend over backwards to make things happen for you. Um, so please just be honest with me. There's no reason any of us have to go through this really shitty conduct trial stuff. Just talk to me. If you think you're gonna need to cheat to do well on a test, just talk to me and I will. I promise you, I will help you get through it. Um, there are some questions in chat I wanna address really quick. A Zoom meeting, this is joined Zoom meetings by Canvas. Does it sign me in under my SFC email? If you use the single sign in, yeah, if you go to sfcollege.edu, you click the Zoom link and use the single sign in, it will sign you in under your SFC email. That's fine. Yeah, Mark, there's no problem with that. That works great. Um, I don't think it should associate any other Zoom accounts you have. So if you had a second Zoom account, but you signed in through the, the SFC, uh, SF College, um, edu web page there, the single sign-in SSO, um, then it should sign you in using your Santa Fe credentials. All right, last syllabus stuff I wanna talk about here is the calendar. Um, this is a rough outline. Things will move around here. So don't take this as being a hard and fast thing. Take this as being a, a rough description of the topics we'll cover um, in each week. Um, and similarly, you know, the exam and project dates, they wig may wiggle around a little bit also, but I'll do my best to stick to this throughout the semester. If we need more time on one topic or we move really fast through another topic, things will move. Um, but you can take this to be a, a rough guide of when the activities will be, when the tests and projects will be, and what section of the textbook we'll be working on on any given week. <clears throat> uh, I'm not gonna go through these in detail. You guys can take your time to go through them in detail if you like. Um, just a quick note here, the homework and quizzes are not on this, right? There isn't room to fit the homework and quizzes on here. So I just have the activities, projects, and exams. Homework and quizzes are all, again, in my math lab. Um, you need to be watching there regularly. You should be signing into MML every day. And that is the syllabus. Any questions for me on this? Are the textbook 
and the my math lab separate or are they together my math lab has an electronic copy of the textbook that you can access um let me show you oh, here we go so if you come down here to e-text Let me give you this link, should pop open in a new tab or a new window, depending on the browser you're using. And it's not bad. It's a little slow loading. Um, a physical copy of the text you can find, they're not terribly hard. The ISBN is in there in the syllabus. Um, but this is what you get access to automatically through um, Pearson. Cool, I appreciate it. If you do want a physical copy of the text and you're having a hard time finding an affordable one, um, let me know and I will, uh, I'll help you find a, a physical copy. Um, one more time before we, before we stop talking about this intro stuff, everybody should be signing in to MML today, right? Just say that one more time. Even if you haven't bought an access code, you need to get into my math lab and register today because there's homework that's opening today and will be due at the start of class next Tuesday. And there's no excuse for not getting in there and getting, getting registered immediately because you don't need the access code to register. When you get to the page where they ask you for the access code, just scroll down to the bottom where it says, click here to start trial access or temporary access, whatever the language is. Um, and that will get you in even if you don't have your access code yet. That will work for two weeks and then it will boot you out unless you buy an access code and put the access code in. So whether you've bought your access code or not, please everybody follow the link from Canvas to my math lab. It's right here, this link. And get registered in the MML course because you've got work to start on there today. I would love to see everybody from this class registered in MML and at least opening that first algebra readiness assignment today, right away. Are there any other questions for me regarding this sort of syllabusy bookkeeping stuff? Let me double check the chat real quick. Chat looks good. So everybody's comfy on how to come to class, what class is going to be, how to do the homework, when the homework is due, all that good stuff. All right, then I'm going to come back over here to the document camera. This is where you're going to see me doing the actual teaching throughout the term. And we're going to get started. Um, we're going to start on chapter one today. And the kind of precursor to the materials on functions are going to be discussion of real numbers and interval notation. Uh, if you've seen this before, I'll ask you to bear with me. I do actually have some really interesting facts about real numbers that may surprise you. So even if you're familiar with the number line, even if you're familiar with intervals, um, I've got a few kind of tricky, fun things that may shock you. Uh, of course, first, uh, the real numbers. And I'll say this, everything I write down here, you should write in your notes. And think of this as an exact copy of your notes. Um, the set of real numbers, is um, all numbers on the number line. Including whole numbers. fractions of whole numbers which are called rationals and irrational numbers Oops, sorry this fresh pen, so it's not quite warmed up yet. Irrational numbers. Uh, these are like 
some examples of irrationals are like the square root of two, pi. There's this number you may have heard of before called E. We'll talk more about those. There are no gaps on the number line. It's actually that last fact that makes the real numbers so special. It's that last fact that makes the real numbers what they are. When I draw a number line, it'll look like this. And the idea is if you had an infinitely sharp dart and you were to drop it anywhere on this line, you will hit a number. We usually think of zero as being you know, somewhere in the middle, whatever that means. Maybe one is here, maybe two is here, maybe three is here. You know, negative integers over here, negative one, negative two, negative three. One of the questions I like to ask people is, uh, you know, how many numbers are there between negative one and three? So think about that for just a second. How many numbers are there between negative one and three? One reasonable sounding answer to that is, well, okay, there's, there's zero, one, and two, right? There's three numbers between negative one and three. But that's not correct. Because between zero and one, for example, there's one half. Between one and two, the number square root of two lives there. Just a little bit outside of three, there's pi. There's infinitely many numbers between any two real numbers. let's say between any two points on the line. This is an important concept and it can be a little bit tricky to wrap your head all the way around. But just between zero and one, there's the fractions one half, one third, one fourth, one fifth, one sixth, one seventh, one eighth, one ninth, all the way. Um, there's infinitely many numbers just between zero and one. In fact, there's infinitely many numbers just between zero and one half. There's infinitely many numbers between any two points on that line. So there is no next number. If I tell you that the domain of some function, whatever that may mean, is all the numbers bigger than zero, that doesn't mean the domain starts at one. That means the domain starts right here, right here, just to the right of zero, just a tiny little bit, just no, no gap at all. Because there's infinitely many numbers just between zero and one. And this kind of leads us into the idea of an interval. The closed interval from a number A to another number B which is denoted or written with a bracket A comma B bracket like this is the set of all numbers X satisfying A is less than or equal to X is less than or equal to B. What does that mean? Well, if I have a number line and A is over here is smaller than B, right? A is always smaller than B in this setting, the left end point. Then the closed interval from A to B includes A, 
it includes B, and it includes everything in between. And every closed interval has infinitely many numbers in it. As long as B is bigger than A, as long as that interval actually exists, as long as there's some space in between here, then there's going to be infinitely many numbers in between, just like we said up here. So there's infinitely many numbers between any two points on the line. So that's what a closed interval is. An open interval is the same, except you don't include the endpoints. I'm going to slide this up now. So here, I'll underline what we were defining. We were defining the term closed interval. The open interval, who is calling me? You cannot talk right now. The open interval from some number A to some other number B denoted this time with parentheses instead of brackets, is the set of all numbers x satisfying the inequality a is strictly less than x is strictly less than b. So there's a relationship between inequalities and intervals. Um, I'll give you a trick for remembering which way the less than and which way the greater than points in just a second. But before I do that, let me just really quickly draw what, what we normally think of as an open interval. A is over here, B is over here. We don't actually include the endpoints but everything in between like this. So just to come back really quick, this symbol right here, the symbol that I'm highlighting using the, the cursor is a less than or equal to. This is also a less than or equal to. This is a strictly less than, strictly less than. So here we're saying, a is less than or equal to x, and also x is less than or equal to b. That means that that number x has to be between a and b. The way you can remember which one of these symbols is which is that it always eats the bigger guy. So the, the less than or equal to symbol here is kind of opening towards the x. It's like, it looks like a mouth that's eating the x. It always eats the bigger guy. So this says, a is less than or equal to x. In other words, x is bigger than A. And this says x is less than or equal to B, or B is bigger than x. So this means two things at once. x is bigger than A and smaller than B. Well, that means that you're to the right of A, but also to the left of B. So you've got to be between A and B. And the same is true for the definition of an open interval down here. This says x is bigger than a. And this says x is smaller than b. So again, x is bigger than a, smaller than b. That means you've got to be in between a and b. And that's exactly what this picture down here demonstrates. The difference between an open interval and a closed interval is that a closed interval contains the endpoints. So let's look at an example or two. Uh, I am going to cover that first page in just a second. So if you're still writing anything from that first page, I'll give you just a few seconds to, to finish that up. All right, moving on. So let's look at some examples, intervals and inequalities. 
when I want to write an example, I'll use this abbreviation, EG. It's a Latin abbreviation, um, exemplus gratia. There's lots of examples, examples, examples. Here's an example. Let's sketch the solution to the inequality two is less than x is less than seven and write the solution as an interval. Okay. Well, when you look at this inequality, it should remind you of one of the definitions, right? The definition right here looks very similar to this guy. First, I want to sketch the solution to that inequality, meaning I want to draw the number line and like shade all of the pieces of the number line that satisfy this inequality. Maybe I put zero on the far left over here. That's fine, you can do that. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We don't have to label all of these, but we should definitely label two and seven. Clearly those numbers are important. And then we need to think about what this inequality is saying. This first piece says two is less than X. Another way to think of that is X is bigger than two. All right, if two is less than X, then X is bigger than two. If Jerry is shorter than Jenny, then Jenny is taller than Jerry. So things that are to the left of two here are not included, right? Numbers get smaller as you go this way and bigger as you go this way. I'm interested in things that are bigger than two, but also less than seven. So that means things like three, four, five, and six are for sure in my set. Also things like 2.5, 3.14, 6.9, all of those are in my set. All of these things here. And then we have to figure out what sort of delimiters, that's the name for these parentheses or brackets, they're called delimiters to put. Since this says x is strictly greater than 2, or 2 is strictly less than x, I know that 2 does not belong in my set. Just like here, we have a is strictly less than x, so we use an open paren. Here we have 2 is strictly less than x, so we use an open paren. And the same thing's going on at the right-hand side here. x is strictly less than 7. So the way we show that 7 is not included that we're not going all the way up to seven is with the open parentheses. Two is not in this set. What about three, five, 6.9, so I'd like you guys to tell me in chat, I'm going to go one at a time, is three, whoops, there it is, is three in this set? Good, Kendra's correct, yeah, and Cassidy, yep, three definitely is in that set, because three is strictly between two and seven. What about five? Is five in this set? Same thing, in chat, just let me know. It is, good, very good. Is 6.9 in this set? Excellent, yeah, you guys got this. Is seven in this set? No, it definitely is not. How many numbers are in this set? Yep, 
Yeah, definitely a lot. Yeah, infinitely many, right? Because not just the whole numbers, but there's infinitely many fractions between two and seven. There's infinitely many irrational numbers between two and seven. And for those who find this a little bit boring, if I were to delete all of the whole numbers and all of the fractions, I would still have the same number of numbers in this set. And that might be kind of mind blowing. The number of irrationals in here, the size of the infinity of the irrational numbers in here, much, much bigger than the size of the number of fractions or rational numbers. All right, so those are open intervals. And you can take an inequality like this and sketch it like that, or you can take a sketch like this and write it as an inequality like that. I want to talk about intervals of infinite length, and I want to make sure we aren't spending too much time here. So same game. Sketch the solution. To the inequality. X is less than or equal to five. And write as an interval method. And write the solution the solution and interval notation. So just like we did before, I'm going to draw a number line. I'm going to put five on it somewhere. But here I don't have another endpoint. Here I just have x is less than or equal to five. So a quick question is six in this set. I'll put six here, we'll put four here. No, it's not, right? Because six is not less than or equal to five. Is four in this set? Yeah, it is. So is three, so is two, so is one, so is zero. So is everything to the left of five. Because anything that's to the left of five on the number line is less than five. So all this stuff, every single thing in here, all the way to the end. Well, there is no end of the number line. You know it goes on forever and ever and ever on end. So we can kind of shade the arrow like this when we're drawing it, and that will indicate that that set goes on forever in that direction. What kind of delimiter bracket or parentheses should I use at the five? And which way should it face? Should I draw a parentheses opening to the right, a bracket opening to the left, a bracket opening to the right, or a parentheses opening to the left? Yeah, Logan and Kendra have it correct. There it's a bracket and it should open to the left. So I know that I want everything to the left of five in my set. So five is the upper bound for this set. And five itself is included. We do use the bracket there because this is a less than or equal to. It's the or equal to that tells me to use the bracket instead of the paren. If I had drawn it the other way, This is a different set, right? With the parentheses. So this is correct for this guy. What inequality describes this set? Very good. Yeah, Logan and Gabe got that got that perfect. This is x is strictly less than five. And I'm going to put this in a little box here. 
because it's a, a slight deviation from what we were talking about, you may want to do that in your notes too. Because there's one thing we have to do from this previous one, we still have to write this in interval notation. So how do we write? x is less than or equal to five in interval notation. <clears throat> Was it clear what I'm asking here, this guy? The guy that we started with, we sketched him correctly. Yeah, Logan's got the right idea that we're going to have to involve the infinity symbol somehow, because this runs all the way off to the left. Now, the only thing I would caution, both, both Logan and Brooke gave us good ideas in the chat there, uh, it's that when you go all the way to the left like this, we call that negative infinity. And going all the way to the right would be positive infinity. So this would be the interval from negative infinity up to and including five. And on the infinity symbol itself, we always use the open delimiter. A uh, fancy name, if you want to impress your friends, this is called a lemniscate. That's the, the real name for the infinity symbol is a lemniscate. All righty. Um, so those are intervals and interval notation, their relationship with inequalities. The last thing we need to talk about are some symbols. Set operations, uh, namely union and intersection. The union symbol is a big U like this, and the intersection symbol is an upside down one. Mathematicians call these cup and cap. A union with B is all the stuff um, from A and B thrown together. And A intersected with B is uh, only the overlap between the set A and B. So we can talk about how to union two intervals and how to intersect two intervals. Uh, and more generally, you can talk about how to union any two sets. If you want to take the set A and the set B and form their union, that's what this is. This is read as A union B. You just take all the stuff from A and all the stuff from B and you throw it into one basket. That is the set A and B, A, A union B. If you want to form the intersection of two sets, A intersect B, you look at what's common to A and B. You look at the overlap between A and B. Throw away anything that isn't in both A and in B. So I want to do a quick example with this, and then I'll let you guys go for the day. Um, any questions on the interval example we did here before I turn the page? Okay, so our last little example for today, again, I want you guys, um, as soon as we leave here, to please go register in my math lab. If you haven't already, go ahead and follow that link from Canvas, or go to portal.mypearson.com, either one, and register for our course in MML. Even if you don't have your access code, remember you can do that. I'd like everybody to do that right away after class. So our last little example here is to write, Let's do zero to one 
you need with one to five as a single interval. Um, and we're going to give ourselves another example here with the intersection, right? Negative two to one. And let's do this um, closed and closed, intersected with zero to two, one as a single interval. So if you're ever trying to work out a problem that involves the you know, operations on two sets, especially on two intervals, uh, it's worthwhile to just sketch them, right? Drawing a picture is usually really helpful. So I'm gonna draw a single number line and I'm going to mark the intervals in question. So maybe here is zero, and over here I'll draw five. So of course in between you've got one, two, three, four. I want to union the interval from zero to one, closed on the left and open on the right. So I'll put the zero, to one interval here in purple. And then I'm going to add the other interval in here. Let's do it in pencil, so there's no way to do this. That's the interval from one to five, open on the left, closed on the right. So if I take everything that's in the purple interval and everything that's in the pencil interval and I throw them all together in one basket, what do I get? It's a fun question here specifically. Is the number one in the set that we get when we union these two? The number one is in the set. Yeah, good. Matthew, Logan, Charles, all correct. Very good. What is the resulting interval then? When I take all of these things and I lump them together into one basket, how do I write that one set in interval notation? What's the left endpoint? What's the right endpoint? And what delimiters should we use? Good, zero and five. Those are our endpoints because every number between zero and five is in there. The only one that was in question was one. Zero is definitely in there because he was included in the original and we are unioning, which doesn't get rid of anything. And five is not in there. He's an endpoint, but he's not included. That's a soft paren on the right, open paren. To sort out the intersection below, we will do the same sort of thing. Only instead of lumping everything together, I'm going to ask what's the overlap. So I'll say negative two, negative one, zero, one, like this. First, I'll draw this interval in purple. Negative two, all the way up to one. And maybe I'll draw the other one on a, on a separate number line. Well, no, no, we'll do it like this. This is okay. And then here in pencil is the closed interval from zero to one. So now I want to intersect these. I want to take the stuff that is in this pencil interval and also in this purple interval. And just take the stuff that is common to both. So 
What is my left endpoint? Remember, I'm just looking for the overlap. Uh, yeah, so negative two is not in the overlap, is it? Negative two is in this interval, but it's not in this interval. Good, yeah, zero is my left endpoint, right? So when I look at the overlap, when I look at the stuff that's common to both, it's just this stuff, right? So my left endpoint is zero and my right endpoint is one. Is the number zero itself in the set? Is zero in this set and also in this set? Because that's what's required to be in the intersection. It is, yeah, good. What about the number one? Is the number one in the resulting set? And remember, that's equivalent to asking, is the number one in this set and also in this set? So on that second question, we have to be a little careful. Is the number one an element of both of these sets? Yeah, it's not an element of this set, right? This set has everything greater than or equal to zero, but strictly less than one. So one is not in this set, which means it's not in the overlap. So here is actually what we get when we intersect those two sets. Now these are just some examples. Your homework has a lot more examples. Um, and they'll also start asking you questions about uh, different ways of representing a function. And that's what we're going to start talking about on Thursday. All right. So I am going to end our lecture here. I think this is the appropriate time, right? 10.45, yeah. So next time we're going to introduce functions um, and I will kind of show you guys the function notation, concepts like domain and range, uh, and we'll talk about linear functions and slope. Hopefully this is all review. It should be pretty quick, um, but I appreciate you guys coming today. Uh, remember, if you have not done so, please go ahead and download and save somewhere safe a copy of the syllabus that is here in Canvas. And also, please, sometime today, get into my math lab. All right, everything you need to get in there is in the syllabus. You just need that course ID. And if you don't have your access code yet, you can click on the uh, use trial or temporary access option. I'd love to see everybody in there today. All right, that is it. That's all I have for you guys today. Thank you so much for coming. I will see you all on Thursday. All right, take care of yourselves, guys. Get started on that homework. Get started on that homework. Bye. Thank you. Bye.